Welcome to the New Day Community Church Sermon Podcast. We hope you are encouraged by this message from the Nichols Road Campus. For more info, look us up at newdaycommunity.org. We are continuing in the arc of the Bible, as Bill shared, the overview of the whole of Scripture. We began with creation. and really took a little bit of time to talk about the significance of the creation story, the fall, and then um, we discussed uh, last week the exodus from Egypt going uh, uh, all the way through the Um, God's mighty deliverance of the people of Israel from the slavery of Egypt and their wandering through the wilderness up until the judges, which was the uh, era uh, of many centuries actually where the uh, people of Israel were ruled by various judges. <clears throat> well, we're going to, uh, uh, you know, like an airplane ride, you, you take off, and then most of the time you're, you're up at a real high altitude, uh, 30, 40, 45,000 feet. And, uh, and that's where we're at this time, because we're going to cover 32 books of the Bible this morning, obviously unable to do so. And and you're going in depth, we're just really getting that 30,000, 40,000 view uh, of the story of Scripture. So we're going to talk about uh, the books of Samuel, 1st and 2nd Samuel, all the way through Malachi. So 32 books, and they're grouped, and often it surprises me that uh, Christ followers often for years never really realize that the Bible isn't in chronological order. Yes, it begins at the beginning and it ends at the end. But the order of the Old Testament books are not in chronological order. They're actually grouped by type or by uh, the uh, <clears throat> genre. And so the history books are grouped together. That would be Joshua, which you covered Joshua and Judges, through the book of Esther. The wisdom books, which is Job through the Song of Solomon. And then the prophets, uh, Isaiah all the way through Malachi, are grouped together even though and, and so that sometimes they're in chronological order, but sometimes they're not. And uh, you need to understand how that works in order to understand the books well. And so Samuel was a real person, a prophet, a powerful story of God uh, bringing them into the uh, position of a prophet and became one of the most significant prophets in the uh, history of Israel. Um, and uh, he's actually the last of the judges and so he ruled as a judge. He was a prophet that was a judge um, that was the person in charge. You know, if there was problems, he was the one that people would look to. And he's the last of the judges because he institutes the monarchy by anointing King Saul. And so Samuel, again, this one idea that I want you to remember through each part of the ark is this, this uh, method or pattern that God uses by choosing a person to lead a people to bring blessing to the world. He did that uh, all the way through. You can see that in each part of the ark. And Samuel does this, the nation of Israel does this by maintaining the messianic lineage, the promise that was given in the garden that the seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head. In other words, the the descendant of Eve would, would destroy Satan and free humanity from the bondage of sin and Satan and death. And so that is transmitted through the Messianic line. And this is the nation, the people, the descendants of Abraham. And it goes through all the way uh, to Jesus. As well as transmitting the word of the Lord, uh, both the uh, prophetic voice of the Lord, but especially the written scripture, these stories and uh, these uh, books of the Bible that were preserved for all these thousands of years. So we're just uh, <clears throat> a little excerpt from 1 Samuel. It says, as Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons to be judges over Israel. But they were not like their father, for they were greedy for money. They accepted bribes and per- uh, per- um, per- perverted justice. Finally, all the elders of Israel met at Ramah to discuss the matter with Samuel. Look, they told him, you are not old. Old guy. And your sons are not like you. Give us a king to judge us like all the other nations have. And here you see this dynamic creep in to the nation of Israel where they wanted to be ruled like the other nations. And they they saw the other nations uh, prosper and nations like uh, 
Egypt and uh, Syria and Assyria and Persia and Babylon. And they would be led by these uh, powerful kings. And they thought, well, that's the answer. We need to change the structure of our government. And Samuel was displeased with the request and went to the Lord. And the Lord answered and said, do everything they say to you, the Lord replied, for it is me they are rejecting, not you. They don't want me to be their king any longer. Ever since I brought them from Egypt, they have continually abandoned me and followed other gods. And now they are giving you the same treatment. Do as they ask, but warn them about the way a king will reign over them. And so it's, you get a peek into the idea of what's happening here and that God's purpose or plan was that each individual descendant of Abraham would live in a covenantal relationship with him. That they wouldn't need a, an outward government to c- c- constrain them or direct them because they would be led by the word of the Lord and their relationship with the Lord. But we see that that doesn't work. You know why? Because people are people. All right? They were human, just like you and I. And, uh, and here we see that God's purposes are fulfilled even when his people live in rebellion and not to the standard by which he calls them. That doesn't, that doesn't stop God from being able to fulfill their plan, even to the point where he says, okay, give them a king, but realize it's going to come at a cost. And even that works in to the purposes of God because it is through that royal lineage that the Messiah does come. So throughout the rest of the Old Testament, we have the history of all of the different kings, and there are quite a few <laughs> that ruled Israel, uh, and, and the many prophets. So all of the prophets that are written and their prophecies are uh, told, and their stories are told, and the different kings and all the stories that are told um, <clears throat> are uh, comprised most of the rest of, of the, the Old Testament, the kings and the prophets, and the wisdom literature is in in that same time period, although Job, the book of Job, part of the wisdom literature, is considered the oldest book. And they don't really know when it was written, but they believe that it was the first of the books of the Bible to actually be written. Uh, and so it was written before Moses, uh, they believe, uh, most scholars believe, uh, penned Genesis, actually the, the Torah. Um, but again, uh, they don't have a strict date on the book of Job. It's considered one of the oldest stories and a foundational ingredient in uh, the, the wisdom literature. All right, so many of the prophets say, so it's a story of the kings and the prophets that advise the kings and confront the kings as well as the people and also preserving uh, the voice of the Lord, the word of the Lord throughout all the generations. Saul being the first king, uh, and we read about him being anointed king in 1 Samuel 9, it says, Saul was the most handsome man in Israel. Kind of like me, you know? Yeah, I just got to find a really small country with a, (laughs) I'm sorry. (laughs) All right, Saul was the most handsome man, head and shoulders taller than the rest. Well, I'm certainly not there. All right, but here there's this handsome, and that's, again, it's a significant, it's like he meets all of the external requirements, you know, big, tall, muscular, young, handsome guy. Um, And Samuel took a flask of oil, olive oil, and poured it over Saul's head. He kissed Saul and said, I'm doing this because the Lord has appointed you to be ruler over Israel, his special possession. And here we have the story of him actually being anointed king in front of all the people. Samuel later uh, called the people of Israel to meet the Lord at Mizpah, a particular location in the city. And he said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, has declared. I brought you out of Egypt and rescued you from the Egyptians and from all the nations uh, that were oppressing you. But though I have rescued you from your misery and distress, you have rejected your God today and have said, no, we want a king instead. Now, therefore, present yourself before the Lord by tribes and clans. And so Samuel brought all of the tribes of Israel before the Lord, and the tribe of Benjamin was chosen by lot. And so they selected it down, narrowed it down to the tribe of Benjamin. Then he brought each family of the tribe of Benjamin before the Lord. And the family of the Matrites uh, was selected. <clears throat> and finally, Saul, uh, son of Kish, was chosen from among them. But when they looked for him, he had disappeared. Poof. 
He hid. And they looked for him. <clears throat> and, they, and then they asked... They prayed, and the Lord said, in other words, uh, Samuel prophetically knew. He says, uh, um, they asked the Lord, God, where is he? They are praying. And the Lord replied, he's hiding in the baggage, all right? He hid in the luggage of all the people that came. Uh, and they sought him out and brought him, and he stood head and shoulders uh, above anyone else. And so we kind of see a little bit about the character of this guy. You know, he's big and strong, but he was kind of shy, and he was timid, and he was afraid. And, and when it came right down to it, he ran and hid. Uh, and Samuel said to the people, this man, the Lord has chosen your king. No one in all of Israel is like him. And all the people shouted, long live the king. So they got what they wanted. They got, wanted a king and they got a king. And he, he begins well. He starts out like, like we saw in that little, uh, short little uh, story where he was, he was humble. He was actually fearful and, and timid in a sense. And, and not, uh, you know, um, uh, over, not uh, overbearing. And, uh, but eventually the, that fearfulness and the fearfulness of the opinions of, of people led him to make mistakes and make rash decisions and he actually violated some of the things that the Lord told him through the prophet Samuel and so he he falls and and commits sin and and does things uh, contrary to God's will and Samuel has to confront him it says uh, what is more pleasing to the Lord uh, when Samuel confronted him and, and, and Saul was trying to uh, say, well, I made these sacrifices. And uh, Samuel says, what is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to the, his voice? And um, obedience is better than sacrifice is another theme throughout all of Scripture. Yes, there was a sacrificial system that atoned for sin, but God's desire is that we live obedient lives, all right? Sacrifices don't make up for disobedience. And Samuel says this, listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission is better than the offering of fat rams. Rebellion is as, the, uh, rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft ah, and stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. Don't want to be stubborn. So because you have rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Then Saul admitted to Samuel, yes, I've sinned. I've disobeyed your instructions and the Lord's command, for I was afraid of the people. Here he confesses the motivation out of fear of people and did what they demanded. And Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to someone else, one who is better than you. And so Saul loses the kingdom. In other words, his descendants are not going to continue to be king. And it is given to a new king, and that's David, who becomes the greatest king in the history of all Israel. Uh, so David there stood <clears throat> there among his brothers, the story of uh, Samuel selecting David again. It was he was the least of all of his brothers. In fact, when Samuel called uh, Jesse, his father, to gather his sons, uh, he didn't even bother to gather uh, David because he was the youngest. He was out in the field tending sheep, <clears throat> and uh, Samuel prayed over each one of the sons. He says, "No, is there is there another?" And Jesse was like, "Oh, well, yeah. There's that little kid out in the in the field, and they went and got him." And uh, that was the one God had chosen, the least of all of them. And so David stood there among his brothers. <clears throat> Samuel took the flask of olive oil he had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the spirit of the Lord came, upon, uh, came powerfully upon David from that day on. And so here we have the anointing from the prophet according to the word of the Lord and David's uh, submission to that and the Holy Spirit coming on him to empower him from that day forward. So David's rule was faithful for the most part. <laughs> okay. Uh, he was a unique king because he was a warrior. And so he could lead the uh, nation of Israel in battles. And he ended up conquering nearly all of the enemies uh, and solidifying uh, peace for the nation of Israel. But he was also a worshiper and he wrote the, uh, many of the Psalms, which is the hymnal of the Jewish people to this day. Uh, he was a, a, a poet, 
He was a, a minstrel, he sang, but he was also a warrior, and he was also a prophet, because many of the Psalms especially are prophetic, especially concerning the coming Messiah. And so David's a very unique character in that he had so many of these qualities that we don't see in very many people throughout the story. Uh, so through David, that messianic line continues furthering the promise of bringing a savior uh, to the world. Uh, uh, and he unites the, uh, all of the tribes. Remember the tribes previous to um, uh, Saul being king during the times of the judges, all the way from the time uh, of Moses bringing them into the promised land. They basically lived separately as 12, uh, uh, technically 13 different tribes, one tribe split into two. Uh, and so there were all these, these 12 tribes and they were families, so they were related, but they kind of did their own thing. <clears throat> And sometimes they would fight with each other, and that's what the judges a lot of is about. And, uh, and then uh, enemy nations uh, oppressing them, and the judges would rise up, and we see these uh, minor things. They weren't functioning as a, as a unit, as a whole. And under David, he restores, he, he not restores, he brings the people, all of the descendants of Abraham, into one nation. And uh, they really prosper under that. And Jerusalem is, becomes the center of the Jewish nation and the center of its religion. And eventually the place where the temple is built. Remember that God showed Moses the pattern for the tabernacle and, and at Mount Sinai. And they built that. And that tabernacle, which was literally a tent, it was made from animal skins. It was a massive uh, 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 mobile a worship center, and uh, uh, that was the center of uh, the religious worship all the way through the wandering in the desert, all the way through the hundreds of years that they were ruled by the judges, all the way up until the time of David, the, the tabernacle was still the center place, and then in the tabernacle was the Ark of the Covenant, and in the Ark of the Covenant were the Ten Commandments, a uh, pot of manna, and remember what else was in there? The rod of Aaron. So what did you say? No, that's different. The rod of Aaron. Uh, so Aaron's staff that budded. <clears throat> and so all of those are significant. Lots of good sermons there. Can't talk about any of them. <laughs> Under David, um, uh, worship is restored in Israel uh, with the uh, David's tabernacle. And what they did was uh, made a, a different type of uh, uh, tent and brought the ark in. And so people would come and worship at uh, Jerusalem. <clears throat> Later, uh, Solomon would build a temple there. A Jewish tradition claims that uh, where uh, 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 Jerusalem is built, a particular hill in the city of Jerusalem, was the very place that Abraham offered Isaac. Um, there's some, uh, it's not 100% agreed upon, but tradition, many scholars believe that this is the place. And in some traditions, it's where God, it's the place where God formed Adam. Again, we don't know. Um, God makes a powerful covenant with David. And you can read that in 2 Samuel. He promises to make David's name great, uh, to secure Israel from all of their enemies and bring them into a time of uh, rest from their uh, uh, warfare to enable his son to build a temple. David wanted to build a temple, but because David was a warrior, God said, no, your son will do it. And of course, his son Solomon does eventually build a tremendous temple that uh, lasts for, for many, many generations as a center place of worship. And he promises to establish a kingdom and a throne for the house of David forever. And that's a key word there, forever. That's a long time, all right? That was a promise to King David. Well, let's see what happens. Like all men, <clears throat> he fails. In fact, he fails really, really bad, okay? As king, he uses his power to bring a, a married woman while her husband was out at war, and he has sex with her, um, and so uh, it's adultery, but it may be worse than that. In our day, it would be considered rape. It's, uh, he used his power to have sexual relationships with a woman, <coughs> um, a married woman. And then he conspired to have her husband murdered because she was pregnant. And he didn't want to be found out. 
And so this is, this is a very, very serious sin. And although David repents after he's confronted by the Nathan, uh, prophet Nathan, it causes uh, a severe consequences for him and his family. Understand, you can commit sin, you can be forgiven from sin, but there still can be consequences that you have to live through as a result of that bad decision. And so the child that was conceived dies. And worse than that, uh, there's ruthless division that causes much, much death for many generations afterwards in David's family line. And so because of his sin, he sets up a pattern of repeated, actually, sexual sin and division and strife throughout his descendants. His other, one son, also the son of the woman, Beersheba, <clears throat> um, Solomon becomes uh, David's successor after a long struggle. And the kingdom under Solomon, who is considered the wisest man ever lived, enjoys a time of great prosperity. Solomon uh, wrote the, the, uh, most of the Proverbs. And um, uh, so Solomon... Uh, was uh, very wealthy. He knew how to manage the nation. And um, also, uh, like all men, he fails in his later years and uh, ends up uh, marrying women that uh, worshiped other gods and being drawn into the uh, uh, idolatrous worship. And uh, God uh, confronts him. And, and uh, from that point on, there's really a decline uh, especially after Solomon's reign of the nation of Israel. And the kingdom eventually splits into two uh, northern tribes forming the nation of Israel, which is kind of confusing because we call all of them Israel, and Jacob, who followed them, is also named Israel. And so you need to understand Scripture a little bit. Like, well, what Israel are we referring to? The northern tribe that went by that name? or the entire people of Israel, or Jacob, the person Israel. That name is used for different things throughout Scripture. And then the southern tribes forming the nation of Judah, from which we get the term Jews. All right? And so the Jews that are alive in our world today are uh, the, the tribe that continued throughout uh, history um, and really never faded completely are the descendants of, of Judah, but we give that name generally to all descendants of Abraham, even if they're of the tribe of Asher or some of the other ones, Benjamin. <clears throat> all right, so these nations are ruled by competing kings, Israel and Judah, uh, most of whom were evil, although a few of them obeyed the Lord. So God uses a broken system and corrupt people to get his job done. Aren't you happy about that? He still is we're all broken people and the church it's not perfect it's a broken system in many ways but god works within the brokenness all right and in our weakness his strength is made evident all right it's god that does it god promises to establish an everlasting kingdom through david was not fulfilled in the natural sense of a worldly kingdom but his descendant, uh, by his descendants, but will be fulfilled by the Messiah who will rule and reign forever as the son of David and the son of God. And that is Jesus Christ. So in reality, David's descendant, Jesus, will rule forever. And that promise to David will be fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. And so not in a natural sense, through worldly power, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. Now it will be fulfilled ultimately in the spiritual sense when Jesus comes down and rules supernaturally. And so First and Second Kings, I just need to clarify this, is another thing that's often misunderstood. And First and Second Chronicles uh, cover basically the same per time period and recounts all of the stories, not all of the stories, many of the stories from the different kings and the prophets who... Uh, 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 deal with them and the different conflicts that the nation in, endures. <clears throat> it's the same time period uh, as God's people struggle uh, with this, these nations torn by both internal and out to external uh, conflict. And so there's battles with other nations. There's battles between Israel and, and Judah. There's all kinds of different conflicts. There's idolatry. 
and there's many, many stories throughout that. <clears throat> um, uh, yet we see in this broken system uh, the continuation of the preservation of the messianic line, as well as very clearly we see the character of mankind and the nature of God. And so these stories tell us that man, and whatever system um, we find ourselves in, we break it <laughs> because we're broken. And yet God's promise is faithful throughout all of that to continue to bring a redemption, to bring sal- the option of salvation if people turn and follow him. And so it's interesting to read some of these stories and the nation will uh, decline because of idolatry, because of an evil king it allows witchcraft or other altars to be set up or, 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 or operates uh, sinfully. And then uh, God raising up another ruler that returns to the Lord or they discover the scriptures and they, they return and begin to practice uh, proper worship and they tear down all these idols and they only worship the Lord God and, and God comes and brings deliverance for this nation, um, uh, you know, and that lasts as long as the people are faithful, but when the people decline, then they fall into disarray and under God's judgment. It's important to understand also that the conflicts with the other nations were only to preserve the messianic lineage, all right? And so uh, the uh, when Israel, uh, the nation, the people of Israel entered into the promised land, yes, they had to to war, to to reclaim the land that was uh, originally promised to God by Abraham, which they lost while they were in slavery. Then God returns them at a set time, uh, 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 and it says in one place, after the iniquity, the sinfulness of the people that were living, living there had come to the completion. In other words, it gotten so bad that God was righteous in, in bringing uh, the descendants of Abraham back to conquer that land, to establish a place where the lineage to the Messiah and the word of God could be preserved. But God, God's people were never meant to be um, <clears throat> uh, offensive in um, conquering other land. And so they had very strict borders and they only fought to preserve their borders. And the purpose for that was to preserve the messianic line and to preserve the word of God for the uh, uh, generations to come, all right? They were never meant to conquer the the world uh, through military uh, means, all right? They were meant to protect the messianic lineage. It helps you to understand some of the the wars and and things that they go through. In the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew Bible is ordered, the Hebrew Bible, of course, only is the Old Testament, um, and it's in a different order, and it ends with the book of Chronicles, because it kind of wraps up uh, nicely there with the people of Israel being taken into uh, captivity to Babylon. And so we find them once again, the people of uh, descendants of Abram, Abram going back into slavery, back into captivity, not to Egypt this time, but to Babylon for 70 years. Uh, the final uh, chronological events in the Old Testament is a return from the Babylonian captivity and the rebuilding of the temple is described in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, as well as many of the most, actually, of the uh, minor prophets, such as Haggai, uh, Obadiah, Joel, and Malachi, Malachi being the last book <clears throat> in the uh, English arrangement of Scripture. And so uh, they were in the Babylonian captivity <clears throat> for 70 years, and it was during then that you have many of the great stories, the story of Daniel. Daniel lived during that time, and, and Daniel in the lion's den, and, and uh, you know, the, uh, 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 the, the guys thrown into the fire, Meshach, what's their name? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? And the name of the fourth guy that they saw in the fire? Yeah, yeah, it was, Jesus. It was an appearance of Jesus in the fire. Uh, uh, and he protected them. All those stories are from their time in captivity in Babylon, which God eventually, uh, uh, Babylon is overcome by Persia, and then king of Persia releases. He kind of changes things up, and he lets them go back to their nation, and they rebuild the temple, which uh, is uh, the uh, the temple in, um, it was called the second temple, 
which was then later uh, restored and, and massively expanded by Herod. And that's the temple that we read about in the New Testament. And there's uh, basically the only part of that that's still remaining, it's called the Wailing Wall, was actually a retaining wall. It, was not, it is not part of the temple, but it's the retaining wall that Herod built when he expanded the, the flat area to when he built the uh, expansion on the temple, all right? And so, uh, and because it was part of that uh, link back to the historical uh, temple, uh, people are there 24 hours a day praying. It's called the, the Wailing Wall because uh, Jewish people and Christians and people from all over the world go. I was there a few years ago, uh, you know, they stick their little prayers into the cracks of the bricks. All right, <clears throat> and so that's the final event. One interesting note <clears throat> is all the way through the Old Testament, um, the uh, people of uh, Israel, the descendants of Abraham, really struggle with idolatry. But there's a major thing that happens in this Babylonian captivity. After they return from Babylon, there's no more idolatry. They don't have idol that they worship. And so when Jesus appears... The problem isn't idolatry with statues or other forms of worship. It becomes an idolatry with their own ideas and the religious system that Jesus confronts. And so it's just an interesting to think about that for a while. All right, Jesus in this part of the ark. One of the uh, questions we want to apply in every part of the ark is, where is Jesus in this? Well, he's the fulfillment of hundreds of of specific prophecies throughout the Old Testament. He fulfills the role of prophet, priest, and king, that all of the prophets and priests and king in the Old Testament characters were there to foreshadow. Uh, Matthew starts out the New Testament with the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Like he just nails it. These are the two most important people, the son of David, David being the greatest king through who? The descendants of uh, the uh, through whom the promise of the messianic line comes to Jesus, going all the way back to Abraham. Uh, I think it's Luke's uh, <coughs> uh, lineage goes even further back from Abraham all the way back to Adam. Prophecy of the many prophecies, one in Daniel uh, says uh, prophesying of, of Jesus says there uh, in a vision he had before me was one like the Son of Man, and by the way, the Son of Man was Jesus's most use reference of himself. When Jesus used a title for himself, he would call himself the son of man. Uh, and that was a title of the Messiah, one of the many uh, biblical titles of the Messiah. He saw the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power uh, over all peoples, nations, and men of every language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And so we, here we have Daniel. Now this is hundreds and hundreds of years later after David's kingdom, long, long in, his, in the history. Daniel prophesizes probably while he was captive in Babylon of this vision of a future king coming to have a kingdom that would last forever, the fulfillment of God's uh, covenant with David. And that prophet was, uh, prophecy was speaking of the Messiah to come, Jesus. Here in Luke, um, <clears throat> another reference uh, referring how Jesus is found in this uh, Old Testament part of the Bible. It says, you will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him uh, the name Jesus, the angel speaking to Mary. He will be great and he will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. So as you're reading through the Old Testament, you, you have to see these are all foreshadowings of, of the Messiah that would come and how God would be faithful in bringing a king that could reign uh, righteously forever. So God's plan in the Old Testament did not fail, all right? The plan was to send the Messiah, a descendant of Abraham and David, to be the salvation of the world. The Israelites did accomplish this by blessing the world with the Messiah, which offers the whole world hope and salvation 
to mankind, and they also preserve the words of God throughout the generations. Jesus, the New Testament, the church, does not replace but fulfills what was foretold in the old. It's really, you know, God's work is uh, uh, constant. God is unchanging. He works within the, the, the weaknesses of mankind, but he always fulfills his purpose. So what does this mean for us today? <clears throat> and what can we do? How can you apply this in your lives? Romans and other places in the New Testament uh, say uh, this, everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. In other words, we need to learn from these stories, okay? Um, so that through endurance and the encouragement of Scripture, we might have hope. You feel hopeless? This book was written to give you hope. This book was written to teach you. You learn from the mistakes that these people made, and you learn from the right choices that many of them made, and, and you learn how to apply it into your life. The Old Testament is filled with rich, rich examples of real people that face every form of challenge, including both successes and devastating failures. And so you can, re, you can learn from that and, uh, and see God's faithfulness that doesn't change, even though his people make some really, really bad mistakes. And even though the Israelites repeatedly violated God's law, uh, and every character falls short in some way, God is faithful. He doesn't give up, and he finds a way to fulfill his promise. And the same is true for your life. When you fail, when you totally screw up, and you think all is lost, no, guess what? It doesn't, it doesn't stump God. He, if he can work through all of the failures of all those kings, my goodness, he can handle what you're going through. If he can manage the failures of entire political systems and uh, world governments and still preserve his word, you know what? He can endure a change of administration in a little country known as America, the United States. You know, I mean, are you hearing me? You don't need to worry. God is sovereign. His purposes will be fulfilled. And we can learn this from Scripture, and it grounds us, it gives us a foundation so that no matter what happens, you go, oh, this is not as bad as what they went through. You know? <clears throat> All right. Jesus is the Word of God, right? Bible is the Word of God, right? So there's a direct connection between our knowledge of these stories, as hard as it may be, we have to actually read some background, get a good study Bible. The NIV study Bible is actually good, even though I don't prefer the NIV translation. It's not bad. <coughs> uh, <laughs> it's a good translation. It's nearly inspired translation. NIV, just a joke. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> but the NIV study Bible is actually one of the best. And so it just has introductions to each book. Um, of the Bible. Read those introductions. It'll teach you all you need to know. Uh, mostly, get a good one, one uh, uh, edition, or now it's, everything's online, but you can get commentaries <clears throat> so you can get a little background. So, you're, uh, so there's a connection between your knowledge of this book and your knowledge of our Lord. And you can't separate that because God's invested centuries upon centuries into the book, a whole nation's history, just so we could have these stories. Read the Bible. Application. Read it. Even if you don't understand it, keep reading it. Study it a little bit. Learn how to learn. <clears throat> uh, learn who wrote each book, why, to whom, and what the major theme of each of these books are. Discover Jesus in these stories, and more importantly, Discover yourselves, discover ourselves and our world through these stories because really not much, much has changed. Don't strive just to understand the Bible, but to understand God's word well enough so that the Bible enables you and I and us to understand our world and how we fit into it.